So Chris, we just took tours of the new fixtures here at CentOS Center, all the renovations in the last eight months. Um, what are your thoughts on them and how do you think that you, as the program, can use them in recruiting? What's impressive, uh, from the uh, brand new training room to slightly less than a year old weight room uh, to all the amenities uh, inside the arena. Um, I mean, you know, the, the new student athlete lounge, there, there are just a lot of things that um, I think just add to our overall athletic uh, department, hopefully the fans experience as well. You know, recruiting is always, um, you know, a first impression when, when recruits come to your campus is, is seeing the facilities. And, um, you know, we're never, we, we're never going to win the war um, with some of the, the, the people that we're competing against. Um, but uh, I think we've evened the playing field um, as well as we can. It's an awesome arena. It's only gotten better. Um, I just think uh, it, it it looks night and day from a year ago, like when you're actually in the arena, even the practice environment, you know, the, the stage lighting makes it a little bit unique. Um, so it's, um, I think it's a real plus for our program and, and the university as a whole. Do you have a better idea today of how you'd like to play, incorporate different players today? How far away are you from, would you say, having a really clear picture of that kind of stuff? Um, we're still practicing against ourselves, like you know, the majority of the teams um, in the country. We haven't scrimmaged anybody else. I think we'll, we'll know a little bit more after the exhibition game, after the uh, close scrimmage. I think we can play a variety of ways uh, on the offensive end. I think we can play with bigger guys in the front court. I think we can go with a smaller lineup. And uh, I think that gives you great flexibility as a coach. So. To say that this is the one way that we're going to play, I think um, we've always sort of tailored how we play on offense to the personnel that we have. We have some really talented players. The key is just making them um, continue to play together uh, and value the defensive end. I think um, we're, we're getting there. We're a lot better team today than we were two weeks ago. But to say, hey, this is the lineup that I see projected, I, I would be lying at this point. Silver lining from Ed's injury. Quentin in there and getting the opportunity he got later in the season. Um, what have you seen from him in this offseason? And how f much further along is he because of that experience that maybe he would have? I mean, the experience is invaluable <laughs> to to have a coach tell you something, but yet sit there and, and, and watch somebody else day after day after day sort of get the opportunity, be able to play through their mistakes. Um, for, for Quentin to be able to go on the floor, you know, have a game where he had three or four turnovers and not be able to be taken out and, you know, sort of grow into a, a voice as a point guard was, was huge for his development. And, um, you know, he, he, he experienced both, both failure and success as a team. And, um, and, he, and he learned from it. Now, in the offseason, he was hurt a little bit. You know, he, he dealt with plantar fasciitis for the uh, better part of the summer. Um, you know, he's back now, but um, not that that hampered his development. He did a great job in the weight room. Um, you know, he probably has one of the most impressive bodies um, at the point guard position in the entire country. And he's certainly um, really, really athletic. That hasn't changed. I think he's become a better finisher. Uh, but, you know, I think these next few weeks in the preseason will help him even more continue to make better and better decisions. Um, but to be quite honest, like he, he did lose a little bit over the summer of the development that you'd like in the offseason of a player. And that's no, not to any fault of his own. Thankfully, he got that experience in games a year ago. Sean really stepped up during the tournament last year. What would you like to see him take from that experience and, and apply to this season? Um, a couple things. Confidence. I mean, if you can do it against some of the, the people that he did it down the stretch, uh, there's no reason you can't do it every single night. And it goes probably in the second word, and that is consistency. Uh, being a guy that your teammates can really count on, not just necessarily to score the ball, Joe, because I think Sean's always proved that he can that he can score, but to rebound out of his area, to not forget defensive assignments, um, to not get in early foul trouble and uh, sort of be a non-factor the rest of the game. I think I'd like to think as a senior, um, you know, he's in a little bit better mindset of knowing what it takes to be ready from minute one. 
and um, so we don't have those sort of confidence lulls uh, during during the season. Have you noticed a big change in Sean since he got back from uh, Spain? Well, he's in great shape. He's in great shape. Again, he's always been able to score the ball. Tyreek's gotten um, infinitely better. Uh, Karam adds something different that Sean's not used to guarding in his first three years. A big guy that can step out on the floor and play that Euro style of you know handoffs and pick and pops. I mean, it's a little bit of a challenge, but um, no, I think I think Sean is uh, in great shape. I think he's a lot more coachable than he's ever been. Not that he's been surly, or but he just he really is taking in uh, what you want from him, and I think it all comes back to he's confident in who he is, and so we expect a big year out of Sean. Is this as diverse, unique, and offensive talent in team you've had here as Adrian? Uh, it's very diverse. You know, you've got some guys that. Um, are extremely experienced and skilled. You have some some freshmen that um, um, don't lack for confidence, but maybe lack in experience. Um, yeah, I think we can play a lot of different ways. Uh, I think defensively we've become better because we become more athletic. Um, and you know, it's uh, it's the challenge that I have that we have. You know, to um, take advantage of all the guys that we have and and, and make them understand that. Togetherness and winning is is paramount. All the other stuff will will come secondary. Any uh, freshmen in particular that have impressed over the summer? Uh, well, I think Najee is um, has had a really really good preseason. You know, it's it's such a. I mean, we're only 21 or 22 practices in, um, so their their learning curve and their room for growth is is through the roof. You know, when you're a senior. You can get better. Um, you can make better decisions. You can um, value things more. You, but it's really hard to, to grow tremendously as a player um, versus a freshman. And so those guys are very at the very, very beginning stages. But, but Najee has really, uh, in my mind, um, stood out in practice as a guy that will be ready to go uh, from the very beginning. He's going to make mistakes just as Elias will and just as Paul will. But I think he's had a really good uh, first two, three weeks of practice. JP didn't participate in Musketeer Madness. Is he OK? I'm going to redshirt JP. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'd love to. love to keep him around for another year. If there's a way that you could play him and redshirt him, that would be even better. Um, he, he tweaked his ankle. Uh, in a one-on-one -on -one drill maybe three days prior to, and, and we're just being cautious. So we're, we're going to sit him out again today. We have an off day tomorrow, and uh, I anticipate him practicing on Thursday. So um, I, JP's twisted a lot of ankles throughout his career, so it's nothing more than that. He seems like one of the guys that's really dedicated his offseason to his physique, and also his leadership has been more apparent, it seems, in the way he's talking to the freshmen, the way he's telling other guys where to go and what to do. Have you noticed that as well? And is that part of being a senior, or is that a growth for JP? I think both. I think you really be, you get comfortable as a senior because nobody's been in the locker room longer than you. You've experienced um, you know, highs and lows. You know the coaches inside and out, you know your teammates. Um, and, and, you, and you know what you really want out of your last year. So I think all of our seniors, and in particular the three guys that have been here um, for four years now, or going on four years, uh, have really taken ownership of our group. No, no, no more so than JP. I mean, he's just um, he's had a phenomenal summer. Um, he is in terrific shape. He, um, as you guys know, he plays to win. He, he plays with a chip on his shoulder. He's extremely confident. And uh, you know you want your team to take on the personality of uh, that type of player, and, and I think we, we slowly are. You lump JP in with Trey, you two seniors who have accomplished so much here at Xavier individually as a team. How much of a difference maker is it as a coach when, when you roll out the ball and, and you send two guys out like that every game, kind of having that as your two leaders? That, that's got to be a difference maker as a coach. I mean, it's. Um, it's what you want when you're a coach. You know, Tony Dungy calls it regenerative leadership, where your oldest players can teach your youngest players in every situation, in every environment. It could be in the locker room, it could be on the road, it could be prior to practice, it could be during a drill, a technique. Um, but you don't have to always have the coaches being the coach. You can have your older teammates, and, and because of their accomplishments, both as a team and individuals, um, it's pretty easy to listen if you're a young guy. 
um, the trick of it with seniors is, you know, sometimes um, you get seniors that want to take that leadership role, but they start to think that because they're a leader that they're not going to get critiqued themselves. They're not going to get pushed. They're not going to get challenged. You know, what type of coach am I if I just say, hey, you guys are really good players. I'm not going to push you. You know, I think every good player wants to be coached and pushed. Um, and so, you know, you always see a few like, why are you getting on me early, early uh, in the preseason? It's because you made a mistake and you're still going to be held accountable. And the, the, the awesome thing about all our three seniors is, is they take the good with the bad. Good players take the good with the bad and they try to grow from it in both cases. And again, I, I know I made it a long-winded answer, but when you have guys like, you know, J.P., Sean, and Trayvon, especially J.P. and Trey, um, it just makes your job a lot, a lot easier. Trayvon, before last season, dropped some weight, rounded out his game a little bit more. What are you all looking for from him this year, areas you think he can still improve on? Um, Trey's a prolific scorer, and I, I always want to make sure that he knows that his value to our team is in a lot more areas than that. You know, when, when he's playing um, at a high level, um, shooting the ball, um, he shouldn't have any more energy on the defensive end than, he, than if he wasn't shooting the ball well. You know, like if he puts winning first, and, you know, he's done a great job in the preseason. I, I think some of the areas that he's grown, you know, pick and roll, handling the ball on the defensive end, being in the right spot, he's communicating more than he ever has in his first three years. It shows me he's valuing things outside of shooting the ball. Everybody in here knows that, that he can shoot the ball at a really, really high level. But, you know, him doing the other things and the little things sends a huge message to our team. Quite honestly, it makes us a better team. And I expect a whole lot out of Trey. And playing to win is, is paramount. And he's, uh, I don't see anything that's outside of that, in my opinion, watching him so far in the preseason. Chris, I know you don't place a lot of emphasis on preseason polls and rankings and stuff like that. But what's your assessment of uh, Big East? Well, I think it's a great league. I think every year it seems like, um, you know, the, our league, for the most part, by and large, always remains older. Um, you know, a lot, there are a lot of leagues where you might lose two or three guys on one team. Take the team that we beat in the um, um, second round or third round or where they, whatever they call it in Orlando. We beat Florida State. I mean, they lost Dwayne Bacon, young guy. They lose Jonathan Isaac, a freshman. And you're going to have some seniors that graduate. And so now you're, you're trying to replace a whole lot. You know, you're, you're replacing experience and you're replacing talent. And for the most part, our league has stayed old. Certainly, we've lost some players here and there. We've lost Edmund Sumner, Henry Ellenson, Marquette, and I can go on down the line. But um, it's not uh, the mass exodus that some other teams you know, feel. And I think when you have experienced teams like that, where basketball matters, you're going to get high-level games. And uh, it's a tribute to us getting seven teams in the, in the NCAA tournament a year ago. I would think uh, you're a college basketball life. You have passion and a love for this sport stuff that's kind of come out this summer as far as FBI probe and investigations and some different programs. And I know he hasn't been an assistant coach here for more than a decade, but Emmanuel being roped into that this program, someone being roped into that. What are your, kind of your thoughts about what's kind of going on with that? I um, mean, it's shocking, but, um, you know, I guess the first thing I'd say is I was really naive um, in the sense that I didn't know that stuff was illegal. I knew it was against NCAA rules, but, um, FBI, you know, I, I would have thought they'd be more concerned with with other things, and that's um, so. I think that was very alarming to uh, to everyone in college basketball. Uh, there's there's a lot of pressure, um, you know, in the positions that we all hold, um, and you know, sometimes people make decisions um, that they all normally wouldn't because of that pressure that they feel, and. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. We're, we're not exempt. We're, we're one of many industries around the country where people make wrong decisions and, and illegal ones and unethical ones. Uh, it's unfortunate because I do feel like 90%, 95% of college basketball does it the right way. And, um, you know, a lot of times it's sour grapes when you lose a recruit. Ah, they must be cheating. It's not necessarily true. But we all have known, and, and there are some programs that I think if you – 
you know, pulled some college coaches without those microphones in front of you. They, they could tell you who they think doesn't do it the right way. And um, I think it would be good for the game to, to, to straighten everybody out and, um, you know, represent more of the guys that do it the right way. I think people would be surprised by 90 to 95 percent. I mean, I, I think the general consensus is people outside of college basketball are like, oh, everybody cheats. Yeah. You, you don't think it's, it's, it's more rampant than that? No. Uh, and the reason I don't is because um, – uh, all, all, all the cheating is centered around kids that, that were top 20 and top 25 kids. So we're all going to recruit 750 to 1,000 kids at Division One schools. Like they're not going to keep going down. The, they're not. I, I wouldn't think a coach is going to cheat for the 458th best player in the country when he can probably get the 459th best player in the country. Again, I, I think it, it really starts to happen when you get some high-level players that have some high-level options. And, um, you know, you get people that have interest that, that have nothing to do with college basketball, whether it's NBA, representing kids, you name it. And that's where I think it, 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 it goes sideways. I don't think it goes sideways with, you know, the senior at Milford who's deciding between, um, you know, two mid-major schools. Chris, speaking of recruits, your recruiting class included Contrevious Jones. He's not here. What is his status? Uh, Contravius fell short um, to be a qualifier for um, the 17-18, you know, academic year. Um, he can be a Division One qualifier, but uh, he fell a little bit short. You know, there's certain NCAA standards that you have to meet, and he did not meet those. Um, but I'm confident that he'll meet them in the future. Now, whether he um, comes to Xavier or not, I, I can't really speak on that. Thank you.